so often I have heard black and brown as though equally entitled to the same things. I've always wondered about the details. Now, an opinion article that explains. I'm Addie Banks and this is my report. Aaron Aubrey Kaplan, October 23rd, 2022, for Portico, wrote, the ongoing scandal in Los Angeles involving four prominent Latino officials caught trafficking in racial insults while conspiring about redistricting immediately brought to mind my father, Larry Aubrey. He died in May 2020, a census year that occasioned the redistricting, and a week before George Floyd's murder set the country on a course of racial reckoning that is still underway. My father was a consultant for LA County's Human Relations Commission, and he spent most of his professional life and all of his retirement working to build meaningful coalitions between Black people and everybody else, white, Asian, and of course, Latino. This is what the job was. But my father took it more seriously than anybody else in town. A dedication that was noteworthy, particularly because he was Afrocentric, rooted in civil rights and the Black freedom movement of the 60s. And he was deeply committed to building bridges from that position, not from some racially neutral stance that some people might assume is required of coalition building. In other words, my father was a humanist, but not assimilationist. He expected those he worked with to be the same, advocates for their own group, but aware of the fundamental importance of coming together to achieve things for the good of everyone, like racial justice, especially racial justice. This is where the four self-appointed power brokers, three elected officials, and the county's top later, labor leader fell horribly short. I have heard other Black people say they weren't surprised by the sentiments expressed in the audio. Former city council member Bernie Park said that the muscling has been going on forever. It just happened to be caught on tape. Another city hall veteran and member of the 2020 Redistribution Council, who never wants to be named because of sensitive political relationships, has been talking to me about the Latina land grab for years. But I can't help feeling let down. I believed in what my father was doing and assumed many of the people who worked with him did too. I counted among those people Gil Sedello, the city council member who is one of the disgraced four and who, thus far, has rebuffed calls for his resignation. After my father's death, Sadillo stood up in council chambers and memorialized him in remarks that were impassioned and poignant, a heartfelt tribute to my father's integrity and unshakable belief in justice for all, which he said, had guided Sedillo's own career. What would my father have said about what's going on now? I know 
what he would say. He would have been disappointed, but also not surprised. My father was an idealist, but hardly naive. He talked to me many times about how sincere, right thinking people, true believers in social justice, ultimately succumb to the status quo, either because they lacked courage to challenge it or because they sided with the status quo more than they sided with justice. He witnessed the shift happening most frequently with politicians who had gone into the business with ideals, but wound up compromising them away. Or after going into politics, their true natures emerged, the urge for power or the need to stroke ego and ideals took a back seat. The temptations were more immediate for black and brown electeds who had historically been kept from positions of power and once ensconced were, were more likely to see these positions as an end, not a means to an end. Latinas were kind of a special case, a group for whom power became a fiat a comply years ago because of sheer numbers. But unlike whites or Asians, Latinas live next door to Black people in South Central. They have been our neighbors over decades, sharing schools and stores and many of the oppressive conditions built into the history of a place that had been home to so many people of color. But Latinas were also a threat to Black people's hard won sense of home. My father strove to put the two together, the togetherness and the tensions to forge a new kind of progress. He was involved in many multi-ethnic efforts in the 80s and 90s, including the Black Latino Roundtable and after the civil unrest in 1992, that put South Central in the national spotlight, the multicultural collaborative. None of these efforts lasted. Reasons why are complicated, but my father always said that the buy-in, what Latinos and Blacks agreed they wanted from each other, was just wasn't explicit enough or compelling enough for anyone to stay at the table. And so, despite the collaboration that happened in the city council, such as black and brown members voting for fair wages and other policies, out in the real world was a reality in which blacks were losing ground to Latinos were becoming a force that increasingly became self-contained and increasingly impervious to Black concerns. The real scandal of the City Council expose is that it shattered the notion that Black and Brown are more aligned than not that we can always overcome policies and politics as usual because of our proximity to each other and because we share a certain worldview. But Black folks, including my father, knew better. While there were always Latino allies committed to racial justice, they saw as essential to both groups the status quo of Latino power, thanks to its ever-growing numbers, loomed larger. 
and larger and became harder and riskier to challenge. At the heart of the scandal was how easily the four either degraded Black people or failed to oppose the degrading. The lengthy, freewheeling conversation confirmed that attaining power almost always involves racism and exclusion. In LA and everywhere else in the country, it's the price of doing business. I can say with confidence, she writes, that my father never denigrated or belittled anyone, not even in private, though he had plenty of criticism of people's actions or lack of action, he remained to the end a staunch humanist. At a critical moment, those four did not. The best outcome of LA's latest civic crisis would be that a new status quo comes to power, one that truly puts everyone in the room. Black and brown allies? I reported in my video Latino anti-blackness at Let's Talk Race Now channel that Professor Tanya K. Hernandez, whose book, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino Anti-Blackness and the Struggle for Equality, what she wrote about the presumed alliance between Blacks and Latinos when the greater truth centers more around Latina anti-Blackness. I looked at a few comments. First stated, alliance? I don't believe the two groups have anything in common. something leftists may not know. Racism exists among all races. Yeah, big shocker. The only people I ever hear using the implied alliance phrase, black and brown, are blacks and white liberals. Seems nobody ever asked the browns if they agreed with the alliance. Latinas use it when it suits their agenda. How about there never was an alliance, only in the press trying to shut whites out? Black groups were strung along as part of an alliance that ultimately aimed to discard them once the number of illegal immigrants reached the number needed to wipe out the competition. As an African-American Los Angeles resident and lifelong California native, the Black and Brown Alliance was never a thing. We all generally got along in a peaceful day-to-day -day manner, but there was never an interlocking arm brotherhood thing at all. Finally, because it was never a real thing to begin with. Okay, I remember years ago, before the influx of Latinas everywhere, Reading about alliances being established with Black leaders, including wanting to join the NAACP and other Black groups, at the time, they were blocked from joining the NAACP. But I do believe that even that has changed. Historically, Blacks have sought partnerships with people of color it is inherent 
in our wanting to be a part and accepting those who have experienced what we have. We wanted to fight against white supremacy. And as, a, as people coming together, we thought that that was the solution. But Mr. Aubrey, like so many black leaders, has had to come to the realization that all people, all people support their own group. They want what is best for their own group and they're willing to fight others to obtain that. Black leaders are still doing this, in my opinion, advocating for greater immigration at a time when citizens are struggling to make ends meet, to pay increased rent, to purchase food, and yet, they have not gotten that message about each group supporting its own. It's time to wake up to a new wokeness. Put citizens first. Support the flag that flies above your head and support one flag. 